Beep boop. All oh, right. This is the way the sound comes out of my face and into your ear holes. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, you got quiet. I did nothing. I touched nothing. I did nothing. Hmm. You did nothing. No, I was just sitting here. Tap the microphone that you think you're using. Like, tap. okay, that did it. All right. Hmm. Why? Does it does it auto? De you have frames for your photos. Sorry. I know. Does it? I know. Does it auto decrease my volume when you start live streaming for some reason? I can't. I can't think of why it would because it wouldn't know that because programmers are sometimes mean yeah that's it um ow <laughs> <laughs> sorry um, yeah uh okay so uh just to let people know we've got a we've got a hard stop at 11:30 because we've got a uh, we've got to switch over to the weekly space hangout, which is a with our very special guest star, uh, Kimberly, almost Doctor Cartier, who is going to talk about her her research. She's going to stop being our one of our panelists and become our special guest. It's a funny thing. Anyway, um, so we got to wrap this up. So we'll, we'll as literally at exactly eleven thirty or in about. 42 minutes I will pull the plug on this episode of Astronomy Cast and then you're gonna go and zip off to uh, I don't know wherever you're going <laughs> I'm I'm uh, going to Raleigh for astronomy days yay and uh, so if you're in Raleigh North Carolina uh, come join me uh, Google Raleigh astronomy days it's down at the museum um, I'd love to see you. I'm giving a talk at noon Eastern. It is not being streamed. Um, but hey, it's citizen science. So it's stuff you've heard me talk about before online. I figured out the problem. I have terrible microphone, terrible headset. That's the problem. My ear, my earbuds are garbage. And they have okay. a faulty, they have a faulty I can't, connection. So I can I can't you can't fix this. Don't worry about it. No. No, and it's not going to cause anybody else a problem. Just me, and you just sound super tinny, but I'm just going to have to imagine. Um, okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Let us uh, let us begin uh, this thing that we do, which we call Astronomy Cast. So we're just going to get, just gonna have to crank right into it. Yeah. Um, okay. Pressing record. I'm recording. Are you recording? I am also recording. Yay! Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 437, Destroy and Rebuild, part one, the Torino scale. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, your weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay. Here we go the Director of Technology and Citizen Science at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Uh, doing great. I still have to, I have to read that one very slowly and carefully and to get through your new title. Hopefully everyone is caught up to speed now on the all the new changes and all the new awesomeness. So, yes. Uh, Yes, and, and I want to say many thanks to all of you who have donated to us the past two weeks. Um, we we are to the point that we can pay this month's bills. Yay. That's always deeply exciting. I'm sure that Fraser, not Fraser, I'm sure that uh, Chad and Susie will deeply appreciate this. Um, so so please keep donating because like next month we have bills too. And, and my... My audio stream just did something weird. Sorry, Chad. I hope it worked. My file you, looks healthy. You still you still recording? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Chad. You're gonna have to edit. Okay. Yep. Um. So so thanks to all of you who've been donating. Um. We're good to cover our bills this month, which I'm sure Susie and Chad will deeply appreciate. Please keep giving so we can pay them next month too. Um. We love all of you. You're fabulous, and um. You keep us going. 
Uh, for those of you who are watching the live stream, you just saw Pamela make a little heart with her hands. Let's get on with the show. So we love to destroy the universe and also rebuild it. Today we begin a new series where we destroy and rebuild. Let's talk about some existential threats we face and ways we could recover, starting with the Sword of Damocles hanging over our heads, killer asteroids. So I, I'm going to admit something here, which is that the existential threat of killer asteroids was actually what got me into space journalism in the first place. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened was, oh, what was I reading? I was reading Pale Blue Dot, I think, and The Case for Mars back 20 years ago. And, okay. And thinking about the existential threat of asteroids and how, you know, we've been hit in the past, just a matter of time before we get hit in the future, and that we need to sort of become a space-faring civilization. And as part of that process, I sort of like, well, and I want to get involved in that. And it's like, how am I going to get involved in that? Well, I guess I, I will use the talents that I have, which is to make things on the internet and use that to participate in this conversation. And and it's been this long, weird ride ever since but here we are 17 years later almost 18 years later uh still doing the same job and it's thanks to my terrified th worry about the existential threat of killer asteroids i i can't judge i got in because of battlestar galactica because like characters had names of constellations when i was six so um that's awesome <laughs> That, yeah, so it it is an existential crisis that hopefully will drive people to think, to look up, to explore. Um, but on any one given day, we only have like a 1 in 65 million chance of death by asteroid. Right. So, so on any given day, we're good. Well, the but it turns out I'm not the only person on Earth to be concerned about this issue. Other people have. In fact... Uh, people have been so concerned about it that they created a scale to measure our collective freak out and how much you can literally freak out and you're like, how bad should I, how, how worried should I be? There is a scale. It goes from zero to 10. Feel free to worry that much. And, and it's actually very, very similar to the scale used for how much you, should you worry about a volcano. So... Uh, if you know the colors related to one, you probably know the colors related to the other and how much you need to run. And while there are volcanoes you should run away from, we currently don't have any asteroids you need to run away from. Right. Okay. So let's go back and hmm, where, where do I want to start? Okay. So let's talk a bit about sort of the scale and devastation that these killer asteroids can provide. And then sort of, t and then we'll talk a bit about sort of the the Torino scale and how the whole thing was constructed, and and then how we measure it. So let's start with the just just let's get a sense of of bad days that can be had. Okay, so so there are actually lots of ways asteroids can destroy our world, and I I have to admit. I didn't fully understand all of the ways by which we could die by asteroid until I went on a dystopian science fiction kick this year. And, and this got me realizing that there are problems beyond the crater and relating tsunamis that we have to worry about that aren't the things they teach you about in your average news article um, so, so for instance, if you have a bunch of shrapnel from space, so say that two asteroids happen to collide in the path of the Earth, and the Earth flies through this cloud of shrapnel, and there's a fairly significant, significant differential velocity between shrapnel and Earth, all of that shrapnel is going to enter our atmosphere and have a lot of kinetic energy. And it could be that all of these bits of former asteroids are small enough that for the most part, they're not gonna hit the surface of the planet as anything bigger than maybe rabbit pellets. But as they pass through the atmosphere, they're gonna have all sorts of kinetic energy that they give up to the atmosphere in the process, heating the atmosphere, which has two bad things. 
The lesser bad thing is a hot atmosphere is a bigger atmosphere, which creates greater drag on the things that are in orbit. And if you have things in orbit that can't get pushed to a bigger orbit, they fall out of orbit, which is bad for the things oh, on orbit. No. But it's worse asteroids for asteroids hit the Earth, and now the space station takes more energy to keep it up. Right, but but it's actually way worse for the people below the atmosphere. Yes, because all it's that like where you started on the scale of, <laughs> of of consequences of a rain of asteroids hitting the Earth. I, I just want to make it clear up front: you're not safe on the space station. To budget a little more for station upkeep. Okay. So, so if you're beneath that asteroid that is currently getting bombarded with shrapnel, and again, we're not talking things that are going to create catastrophic craters. We're talking things that might create rabbit pellet sized rocks hitting earth, but there's a whole lot of mass with a whole lot of energy passing through our rotating planet's atmosphere, giving up its kinetic energy to that atmosphere where that energy is getting converted to heat. Now, when you heat up our atmosphere, this is like turning on your oven. Everything gets really hot, and if it gets too hot, you die. Okay, right. So so a direct impact from a Texas-sized asteroid, uh, of which there's only one, which is serious, and it's not going to come anywhere <laughs> close to us anytime soon, but that was an Armageddon reference. But the direct impact from a one to ten kilometer asteroid, the the that first impact where it smashes into the Earth is a problem. But the other part of this is that rain that comes back down. The shrapnel goes up into space, rains back down around the Earth, heats up the atmosphere. How bad? Um. So depending on just how much kinetic energy it has to lose. I, it could actually kill everything that's above the surface of the water and the dirt. One of the interesting articles I read earlier this year after reading Seven Eves and going, no, that can't be true. No, it's true. Um, one of the interesting articles I read talked about how one of the reasons we probably got so many mammals out of the death of the dinosaurs is those suckers were smart and they were burrowed under the dirt. And by being a few centimeters under that insulating soil cover, they didn't get baked. Now, even if you don't die because the atmosphere reached a couple hundred degrees, um, it's going to kill a lot of your food sources, kill a lot of the plants that well, if anyone's ever had a house plant out there, you know how easy they are to kill in general. Um, so there's, yeah, heating the atmosphere bad. Now, once you heat the atmosphere, there's some additional side effects you have to worry about. Such as? Such as? So, so what happens to ice when you heat it up? Oh, I see. So the ice melts. All the ice melts. All the, all the snow melts. melts. Right. All of it. So, so now we've taken like all of our reserves of fresh water and dumped them into the sea, changing the salinity of the ocean. And when you change the salinity of the ocean, uh, some of the currents that are driven by changes in density between hot and cold salt water no longer have that salt right. in okay. the water. So, so not only have you, so you think you're safe in the water, but now the water that you were living in is now poison to you. Um, and I guess the, but also not good enough for the creatures that evolved in rivers and lakes. So, and it, well, they, don't, and you, they don't care because their water boiled away. Okay. We've, we've also killed the currents. So, so you initially melt all the ice, all the ice gone, but now you've killed the minute mid ocean convection level convection um, current by changing the salinity of the oceans. And when this happens, suddenly uh, you don't have the warm tropical water getting carried uh, to the polar regions and keeping places like England nice and friendly and temperate. So you melt all the ice and then it's happy to come back. You have gone to a very dark place, Pamela. <laughs> Uh, I I think maybe you need a more positive, hopeful next book to read. You clearly read Seven Eves and Lucifer's Hammer, and you went down all this 
this dark place and then you just were like is this real and then you i live in the united states lucifer's hammer is friendly (laughs) so okay so that's the i mean that's the big rock that's the that's the that's the the life killer right but but you get smaller impacts and we saw with chelyabinsk we've seen that the earth does get smashed on a regular basis with smaller objects something in the 100 meter scale something in the 10 meter scale what are the impacts of those smaller objects they're not going to set our atmosphere on fire no so if you have one friendly smaller object coming along it may poof the atmosphere up a little bit again with the poof atmosphere like well the kinetic energy has know, to have some sort yeah okay and and so but it's temporary this is the kind of thing that that actually the grail mission did a pretty good job studying with the moon where we actually had amateur astronomers who uh, studied the moon looking for bright flashes that were tied to uh well small things hitting the moon not big things small things and so you get a bright flash when that kinetic energy gets turned into other forms of energy and so when that happened grail which was sensing the moon's extraordinarily thin diffuse atmosphere could actually see that atmosphere poof up not grail sorry uh the laddie mission the laddie mission was the one that did this so okay so so but i mean in terms of like impact you know we're looking at things that can take out a region a city the the impact of you know, a very, what, a five megaton, 20 megaton nuclear explosion going off in a city. We're talking, if you're at ground zero when that thing hits, then your city is gone. And and I'm kind of okay with being in ground zero because surviving after it hits is where things get tricky. So, so let's, let's start with a, a smaller thing. So let's imagine you have a 20 meter asteroid comes along it hits the atmosphere this is 376 kilotons of kinetic energy um so this is going to create a giant airburst up in the higher atmosphere we know what to do with things like this you start to get something that is in the 80 meter 80 90 meter you're now looking at more like 30 megatons of energy um but we're still looking more at an airburst now once you start getting over a hundred um then you're definitely going to hit the earth and you're looking at like a 1.2 kilometer crater now, as far as we know, these only occur about every 5,000 years. Yeah. So any given year, one in 5,000 chance. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So the, I want to talk about the actual Torino skill now. We've, just, we've set people's brains on fire here. And don't worry, this, this story will have a pretty reasonably not scary ending. So stick with yeah. us here. Uh, but you get to this – so – so there are different objects of different sizes. There's a bunch of them out there. It's not a matter of if. It's a question of when. One of these things is going to hit the Earth uh, and cause some damage. But but how much damage? How much should we panic? How much should we worry? And so this is this idea of the Torino scale, a measurement for how much you should panic. So where did this idea of the scale come from? It it basically comes from a bunch of scientists, including Torino, go figure, um, who... Uh, Sorry, it was actually created. Let me go back, Chad. You're going to have to edit that. Um, I'm sorry, Chad. I like you, Chad. Um, so the Trino scale comes from a bunch of scientists, in particular, um, Benzel, who was at MIT, where many good things come from, um, who were concerned that, you know, these kinds of impacts happen. And they held a conference, and it was in Turin, so Torino, Turin. And at the meeting, they sat down and they started to talk out how do we classify things? Because scientists like to put things in boxes. We have planets, we have dwarf planets, we have Trina level four, we have Trina level six. These have very specific scientific meanings. So then when we talk to each other, we, we know exactly how much to worry 
exactly what we're looking at and how much follow-up is needed because yeah. scientists like to know is this something i should be interested in or is this something really boring that i can ignore for the next well rest of my life yep uh right and so they've got this this scale so let's kind of go through the the classifications of the scale to get a sense of of where they go so let's start with with zero so so i guess just to set the stage here each object that is discovered every asteroid is given a measurement on the Torino scale. And yes. zero is fine. Don't yes. worry about it. Yes. So let's move up through the scale. So so zero, uh, also shown in white. So quick scanning down a list, you know how much you need to be afraid. Um, this is, it's not going to hit. It's also perhaps a small object that's going to burn up in the atmosphere. So don't worry about it. Be chill. It's cool. It's just a rock in space. Let's so so that is and and we'll get we'll we'll count up the number of different objects in the different scales when we get to the end. So let's kind of move yeah. through and, and talk about the, the next level then. So let's move through the green and, and then so into the yellow. Green is just level one. Uh, this is something that we discover on a regular basis. You've probably seen on Twitter, asteroid discovered passing two Earth dist two moon distances away from the Earth. There are things that that uh, don't need any attention, but are cool to know about. Hey, rock out there, flying by. Take a look. It's cool. But it's. But um, I guess the point with with the, with the one right is that they. They can't completely conclusively rule out that this thing isn't going to cause some damage in the far, far future. Yes. Right? That, they're, that more observations are required, but the expectation is when they do those observations, it's going to come back to, to zero. Yes. Okay. And and so it it's definitely in the category of um, – this is something that we just discovered. It doesn't appear to pose an unusual risk. But hey, let's just verify its orbit now and then. Okay. So Ceres, for instance, is a zero. It's orbiting far, far away. Ceres is never going to hit us. Some of these asteroids that fly by at twice the lunar distance, uh, they might in the future come back and whack us later. So let's just make sure they're not going to. All right, let's move on to uh, sort of the, the yellow zone, the ones that merit attention. Yes, and these we actually get periodically. These these are the oh, spoiler ones. alert. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so these are the ones that we look at them, and when we do the initial, um, what is the error ring around its orbit? We realize the Earth just might be within that error set, and and so probably want to follow up on this just make sure we're not actually like gonna get hit in a bad way um so these are generally again routine uh things land in this category when we don't have really good observations to narrow that orbit down a lot so if you think about it if you know where an asteroid is plus or minus a thousand kilometers plus or minus actually a thousand kilometers is super good so let that one sink into your head. So if we know where an asteroid is plus or minus 20 times the distance to the moon, that's a pretty big error bar. And it's not that hard for that error bar to include the Earth for a lot of these asteroids that have Earth crossing orbits right. when we look far into the future. Right. And then let's move into the one you should be worried about, which is the threatening zone. Yeah, so uh, this is categories five, six, and seven. These are things where critical attention is is really needed to make sure it's not going to hit because its orbit really is looking like it's going to be close and we might want to do some contingency planning. Um, and then as the object gets bigger um and the uncertainty doesn't go away um and the closeness of the encounter appears to get closer we get 
from the friendly statement of a close encounter posing a serious but still uncertain threat of regional devastation for level five to at level seven, a very close encounter by a large object, which if occurring this century, poses an unprecedented but still uncertain threat of global catastrophe. I love the wording yeah. of these things, by but, the way. But but I guess the point, the distinction here is that we're into a place where there is an object that is probably, maybe going to hit the Earth in the in a fairly long period of time. They're there. The, the size of, you know, if it's a five, it's a small object, it's going to cause regional issues. If it's a seven, it's a much larger object, it's going to cause potentially worldwide destruction. But the time frame is long and your opportunity to, to stop it, redirect it, prevent it, or just better study it is still available to you here. Right. And let's move on and, to the red zone. And so the red zone is, yeah, it's going to hit... Um, which, which, while making for a fabulous plot for a book or a good movie or a great way to ruin a movie. Yeah. Um, We're still waiting for that good movie, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Deep Impact tried. Yeah, it, tried. It, was, it was fine. Um, so with these, these objects, they're, they're going to hit. And it starts to become a question of, is it hitting land or water? Is it hitting a populated area or an unpopulated area? Just, just how bad is it? Right. Um, I mean, like yeah. the eight, the, so the eight on the scale is it's absolutely going to hit us, but it's just going to wreck a little portion of the earth. Maybe it's just going to take out a city, um, cause a tsunami it's, it's for sure gonna hit it's gonna really suck and you know you're looking at the what do they say the between the 50 and once per 50 years and once per thousand ten, a thousand years that's yeah. right so these smaller ones sort of like a like if tunguska could have been predicted it probably would have been an eight maybe a little smaller than an eight if they saw yeah. tunguska coming in they would have called that an eight Right. Yeah, I, I suspect that's or the case. Or Chelyabinsk, yeah, Chelyabinsk or Tunguska, you know, like a like a pretty big impact. In the end, it you know, didn't cause as much. I mean, Tunguska would have been an eight. Chelyabinsk maybe not quite an eight. Would have been bad. And and one of the amazing things is we don't actually know how frequently these things happen. So our current estimates on how frequently Tunguska or Chelyabinsk or any of these apparently preferentially hitting Russia events occur. Um, our estimates of frequency are every 50 to a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. So, and then when we go to the nine and we go to the 10, we're just, it's just how much of your planet is absolutely going to get ruined. Yeah. So uh, if you've read the book, Lucifer's Hammer, I hear that was probably a Torino level 10 event. And this is where uh, the definition runs. A collision is certain, capable of causing global climatic catastrophe that may threaten the future of civilization as we know it. Whether impacting land or ocean, such events occur on average once per 100,000 years or less. Right. And on the on that one end of the scale, you probably have like a kilometer-sized object that if it hits Earth, it's going to heat up the atmosphere and end human civilization. If it hits the water, it's going to heat up the atmosphere and end human civilization. doesn't matter where it hits. It is the, it is the end of your time. And, yeah. and, and, and that, that's the smaller one, but we can go all the way up to the 10-kilometer, like the, um, the Chelya – no, the – No. No, the um, – Chichalub, right? The the one that killed yeah. the dinosaurs, right? Chichalub. Chichalub. Yeah. So you're looking at something that happens once every 65 million years. So that's right. all, that's still a 10. I know you think it would go to an 11 or a 12, but once you hit 10, for our purposes as humanity and civilization, the story is over. And and I mean, one of the other things that we haven't even brought up is if these suckers happen to have fallen apart. And you have multiple bits hitting, 
with these big ones, you end up with a large chunk hitting the earth somewhere, large chunk of varying degrees of largeness. And when they hit, they're still hot. And if they hit in water, you have now just taken a really hot stone, essentially, and dumped it in water. And there are cooking techniques where you grab a hot rock out of your fire and you put it in your soup to, to cook your soup. Well, we can turn our oceans into a soup that boils off. Right. And that is, again, bad. Okay. Now, we're sort of nearing the end of today's episode in the beginning of a long list of existential episodes, but um, uh, but also some positive ones. But I, I promised people that we'd give them some good news at the end. So, so we understand the Torino scale. Every object that exists in the solar system has been given its classification on the Torino scale. How many tens are there out there? Of, of things on the Torino scale? Currently on the Torino scale, how many tens are there? Well, if you count zero as a place, they're yeah. they're all at zero. Right. I'm literally looking at yeah, there was nothing. Uh, the NASA website. So if you go to neo.jpl.nasa.gov slash risk, yep. it lists out all of the suckers that yep. we need to maybe worry about. Yep. And currently, everything is either a small object that's 50 meters or less or a zero. Right. So if we went down the list, number of t- t- you know, how many are, are in 10 on the Trina scale? Zero. How many are nine? Zero. How many are eight? Zero. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Zero. There is not a single object today that is anywhere on the Torino scale. In other words, for all of the objects that astronomers have studied across the entire solar system, every single asteroid, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of objects that we know about, you don't have to worry at all about any of them ever. Yes. Now, that said, asteroids have climbed the Torino scale briefly at various times when they when they do to get, get discovered. Right. So so the asteroid Apophis is probably the most famous of all of these. It shares the names with a mythological god and a character from Stargate who was named after the mythological god. Um, it looked for a while like it might not on its most uh, near term uh, pass by the Earth, but in a future pass by the Earth, uh, fail to pass. And there's some things that you don't want to say thou shalt not pass to. Asteroids are one of them. Um, right. And, and so there were, there were a whole bunch of movies. There's a whole bunch of hoopla. It, once we refined our understanding of the orbit, it's fine. Yeah. And so, so Apophis, for example, when it was first discovered and when it was really studied, astronomers put it up to level four. Yeah. It started as two and then they pushed it up to four, which for your memory, four is a close encounter, a close encounter. meriting attention with a 1% or greater chance of collision capable of regional devastation. So in other words, based on all the calculations, there was a 1% chance that this object was going to crash into the earth down the road and then more observations downgraded again to to zero where it belongs and every now and then a new object is found it goes to one sometimes two and then goes back down to zero and where we stand today there isn't a single object that we observe that is any kind of risk to us but it's fun to read about the potential risks so so while you're out there everyone stay safe and go find yourself a good dystopian fiction that you can learn science from Exactly. So there you go. Good news. Uh, there is no threat to any asteroid today, uh, but we, you know, and we'll update you if it ever happens. And we get all the time, people are freaked out about various asteroids. They're worried about, I forget the, what's the one now, DF9 or something like that. There's a new one that that's making the rounds and people think it's going to crash into the earth on February. It will not. No, no. Don't worry. We're good. Yes. We're good. We're You're fine. fine. Yeah. So. And and so if you want to hear us tell more stories about potential devastation of the planet Earth because the universe is and, trying to kill you. And the universe itself. Yes. I want to talk about um, some, uh, some other existential <laughs> threats. 
<laughs> we're, we're starting in on a new series and you can make sure we can pay our editors to edit this series and our producers to get it all out pushed to you on the internet by going to astronomycast.com slash donate. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Pamela. We'll see you uh, next week for another terrifying uh, threat from space. See you next week. See you later. All right. How do I do this? That's right. I stop that. Yes. I need to remember nodding at you doesn't work on a podcast. Yeah. You nod and everyone hears, <laughs> yeah. hears your nod. That, that was not the smartest thing I've ever done. So welcome to the stage where we save the show. Save the, we say, let's save the show. Uh, <laughs> um, Double okay. entendres, yeah. anyone? Yeah. Um, okay, this is 437? Yep. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah, I want to talk about vacuum decay. Okay. You've, you've, we've, we've hinted in the past about, yeah. about how, you know, one bad collapse could destroy the entire universe in a heartbeat um, but it doesn't make good science fiction <laughs> no but that's <laughs> that's not my problem <laughs> i'll let that be a uh, i'll let that be a, a a writer's problem and then we're gonna and then in terms of of rebuilding we're gonna be talking about some things about um, I'd like to talk, you know, we're talking about some, I think some extinction events and sort of how things recover and what we uh -huh. see the kind of after extinction events. And we're going to talk about geoengineering. So ways we can try and kind of protect the earth. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about some of that stuff for some of these episodes. Who knows how long we'll go. Uh, as always, we are just, it's just our fickle, you know, instincts of the day. Uh, okay, so we've got about 15 minutes to to talk to you guys. Um, and I'm going to bend over and pick up my phone because it fell while we were recording. Oops. Um, and I didn't get a chance to say hello to people. Let me do that quickly right now. Hello to Adam Synergy, Brandon Musa, Colin, ja Colin Jones, D. Hardy, David Joseph Wesley, uh, Dane Coveu. Elit Avron, Guido Bibra, John Suffield, Lillian Brennan, Michael Jobin, Nancy Graziano, Arnstro, S. Wolberg, Cy Pocket, Spadi Ninja 9, Stu H., Susan Murph, our producer, Tom Van Scotter, William Van de Beek, Woody Woody, and Zach Cody, and all the other people as well. I think you have to have said hello in the last. Cuvio. Cuvio. <laughs> I'll get it someday, man. Um. And someone from the valley said hi to me, so that's awesome. Welcome. It's cool to see people in in my valley saying hello. Fans of the cool. show, also fans of the Comox Valley. Uh, okay, so let's take some questions if you have it. Okay, uh, Woody, Woody, Ken, Dark Energy, rip the universe apart. Say that again, slower. Can Dark Energy rip the universe apart? Yes, maybe. What? Does it have the ability? Yes. Well, well, Will it? Don't know. Well, hold on though. Would it rip the universe? Wouldn't necessarily tear the universe apart. It would tear things in the universe apart, but the universe would, itself would still be fine, right? Yes. And that's only if the big rip scenario is true. Yes. So uh, there you go. Big rip, of course, being the. But right now, we dark we know that dark energy is pushing things apart. But is it possible that dark energy is increasing? If it is, then the scale of the things that it can push apart will grow, and eventually it'll grow, push galaxies apart, tear solar systems apart, tear atoms apart. At the end of the day, though, the the the, the fabric of the cosmos itself will remain. Uh, David Joseph Wesley wants to know which dystopian sci-fi book I should start with. Um. Well, Seven Eves is your current yeah. save and mine. So, so Seven Eves is kind of amazing. Um, Lucifer's Hammer is old sci-fi, so it suffers from, like, it betrays society of the 70s. Mm -hmm. So uh, that trigger warning, I guess, for people who don't want to be treated like they were in the 70s, it has don't lots want to of, remember like... Remember the 70s? Well, it, it like includes they kill off all the blacks right. and that's kind of how they phrase it, which is just kind of disturbing. Um, 
So, so Lucifer's Hammer is the one that I just read. Um, what was the other one? So this is the Jerry Purnell and Larry Niven combo, and the I really enjoy this sort of their the the books that they worked on together. The you know Larry Niven has got these amazing ideas. If you read some of his like short stories and stuff like that, they're just wonderful. The problem is Larry Niven's writing is very much like here's a crazy idea I thought of, and then that is that is how well he does the the actual characterization and things like that. While yeah. Cornell is is pretty good at at sort of putting in the characters and telling some of the actual stories. And so to put those two together is is a real match made in heaven. Uh, the other one they did was um, Oath of Fealty, Football, and Lucifer's Anvil, or Samel's Forge. Right, but did they do the Moat in God's Eye? Did they do that one together? I, I um, yes, they did do that yeah. one. It's, so Moat in God's Eye for, is probably my. That's excellent. Yeah, and that's probably my favorite collaboration between them. And the other one is um, Football, I think. Is that yeah, what it's they did. Which yeah, was about, it's another Hugo winner. It's the alien invasion story. So you get the alien invasion story, you get the the asteroid apocalypse story, and you get the uh, alien encounter story in the Moat in God's Eye. Uh, the so those are those are all great. I think my favorite. I know I've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole, um, but my favorite sort of alien invasion book is Childhood's End. By yes. Arthur C. Clarke, and you know they it just does not bring you joy. No, no well, <laughs> no, it doesn't. No they, they just did a, you know, they just did a on the Sci Fi Channel. They did a three part episode of it, and it was I really liked it. Uh, I, I don't know if a lot of people really enjoyed the television version of it, but they really kind of captured the smart things about the about the book about child about childhood's end and the way the aliens invade. And the way they interact with us was great and yeah. sort of the complexity of what they're doing. If you haven't read Childhood's End ever or haven't read it in a long time, it's uh, it's so good. Um, ba -ba -ba. So in in the modern dystopia, uh, if you like climate change dystopia or, or genetic engineering dystopia, uh, Paolo Bagagalupi, he did Water Knife and Wind Up Girl. Water knife will scare the bejesus out of really? you, especially live in the American Southwest. Wow, water knife. It's just a little too close to home. Yeah. Just a little. Um, and then in terms of video games, if you want like existential threats, I <clears throat> really enjoy the Mass Effect series, of course, uh -huh. which has the best concept ever put to media, I think, of the Great Filter. Okay. So if you've never played the Mass Effect games, they are – the games themselves are great, but the underlying world building that goes has gone into it is just wonderful. Um, let's see. There you go. John Suffield. So what is it? Zach Cody is saying three-body problem series? I haven't read that. Oh, that – is that really – yeah, I guess that is dystopian. It's it's brand new. It's translated to English. Uh, it got the... Um, did it get the Hugo last year? I think it got the Hugo last year. Yeah? Oh, I've never even heard about it. Liu Sizin? Yes. Wow. Cool. It's I'm on it. All right, that's awesome. Keep hit us with your books. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, Iron Maiden has a song about childhood's end, apparently. Uh, yes. Not I, entirely the same. I didn't know that. Um, so, from Brandon Musa, could a impact ever affect Earth's magnetic field, and how? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Earth's magnetic field is caused by the rotation of the Earth's inner inner core. So to mess up the inner inner core, you'd have to hit it with something pretty big, like yeah. Mars, right? Yeah. So, no. Um, <laughs> Did you see what John just put in the... What? How to stop worrying and love the asteroid? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, would colonizing Mars ever be a last resort? So, so getting to Mars really hard, not something you can do instantaneously at the spur of a moment. Um, this is one of the things that actually gets talked about in Seven Eves. It gets articulated fairly well. Um, you're not likely to quite make it. So let's just build a really fast space station because we know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Bigelow, go. Yeah. And that, and that's, that is the solution, right? Like. Yeah. Been, you know, if you have seven if you have the the advance notice, then you get off the get off the planet up into space and try to survive. Yeah. Uh, which okay, what's next? Uh, questions, questions, questions. We have a smaller group today, so there you go. Um, Ellen Arvin wants to know: Does vacuum decay at the inverse square root? I guess. How fast know. does vacuum decay? Speed of light, I think, is the is the speed I the vacuum decay know. goes. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, the gold at the starbow's end, says Arnstro. Into the world type scenario. Okay, I don't know that one. Um, John Suffolk says, I recently heard that we we're living inside a nebula, but we can't actually see it because the dust that makes it up is too sparse. Is this true? Um, not like the Orion star forming nebula or anything like that. We do live in dust. There's dust outside of our solar system. Um, but when we do mapping of how much dust there is, it, it is near as we can tell we aren't in like some rich nebula or anything. Right. Um, and, and this is sort of one of the problems that actually astronomers needed to figure out was, are we living in a dusty region of the Milky Way? Because that dust would surround us and affect all of our observations. And there is some dust and astronomers, if I understand correctly, they do account for it. You yeah. do have to account for it in the observations that you make. So when you yeah. are observing, there's a reddening that's happening, right? From the dust and around us. And, and the issue is that if you're trying to calculate the distance to a galaxy based on its colors, uh, false color due to the amount of dust between you and the galaxy will uh, introduce a bias in your measurements so that it artificially makes galaxies in one direction look nearer or further than galaxies in another direction because those two directions have differing amounts of dust. Right. Cool. Uh, his of David Joseph Wesley says, I'm currently writing the pilot of a TV series involving today's topic. You guys totally helped me out. Right on. I'm glad we could, we can't wait to watch it. Um, if you need a voice of doom, I'm happy to be your voice of doom. Oh, you do not have the voice of doom, but if you, you know, the computer, I think you, you could be the computer. I could, yeah. yeah. I want to, I, I yeah. would love to be the voice of a computer someday. Um, do you know the how the video showing the orbits of exoplanets around a distant star that was released today was created? Sorry, clunky yes. syntax. Uh, I haven't seen that video yet. Oh, it's fabulous. Uh, HR8 something, something, something. Yeah, it was images taken uh, with Keck uh, Observatory using uh, a chronograph to block the light from the star. And... It's a very young system, so the the hot Jupiter, not hot Jupiters, the still forming Jupiters in the system, are much bigger, bloated, happier, warmer than they will be later in their existence. Um, it's actually a video that was uh, rendered by a graduate student at UC Berkeley, which makes it even cooler. Uh, the observations were done by an observer who's part of Canada's National Research Council. So Keck observations rendered by a grad student doing the research, uh, working with a Canadian PhD. It's cool. Can you link? I'll, I'll show it in the YouTube stream. If someone can. It's can... on Twitter. I'm risking the universe opening Twitter. Just oh, don't do you. it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay, fine. I won't do it. What's Give me something that I can Google it, though. Uh, okay. Um, Looking through my history from earlier today, uh, when I was looking it up, dang it, I have too many screens and windows. So it's a Keck. first world problems. Uh, 
Uh, I'm typing. Show full history. Um, it, it's a, it was a news release on astrobiology earlier this week. Okay. Um, H799. HR8799. HR8799. A four planet system to orbit found the link. So this doesn't have the video, but it has a still from the video. Okay. And then the video was on Twitter. I don't know where this is going to open. Oh, there it is. Okay. So is it, is it, okay, 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 hold on, hold on. Wait for me, everybody. Wait for it, wait for it. Okay, I think I got this working. Okay, the browser is going. I don't know if there's any sound. Oh my god! Look at that. Okay, let's do this again. One more time. I again. Okay. Do you see those little planets? <gasps> Isn't that fabulous? That is unbelievable and we should end on that note because i have to run to the yeah. airport and you have to prep for yep. weekly space hangout so we're gonna do the weekly space hangout after this uh we start in about half an hour with our very special guest dr kimberly cartier sounds uh, great all right maybe we'll talk about this some more all right see everybody later um and we'll see some of you in about 30 minutes now what do i do all oh, right i stopped screaming <laughs> bye everybody it's all backwards. <laughs>